you, you, you are now about to witness the strength of street knowledge. Let's discover how a couple months, but it's in this, this, this enough for you to know what's up in the hood. My neighborhood has its ups and downs like any other neighborhood. But I, my neighborhood is in particular. I'm from Humble Park. See, in my neighborhood, the ups are that people take care of their property. They do everything they can to help out the young people. But the bad things are there's a lot of gang activity. There's a lot of drug sales. I also see uh, young teens there that you know get involved with the younger children and they go to like the uh, Boys and Girls Club to help them out and they also, you know, help clean up the neighborhood from time to time. Where I used to live, before I used to live in Humboldt Park, I lived far, like on Noble Street. And well, over there, it was really quiet. Everybody knew everybody. It was kind of like a small town, well, in a big city. But when I moved to Humboldt Park, all that had to change because I was like, okay, all these people over here are pushing me around. Well, it's time to get tough. And you know, it's time to earn my respect. But <sighs> there's a lot of empty lots in the neighborhood, like, the every like every other house there's an empty lot and that's kind of a sore eye to people and that makes the neighborhood like look bad because it's like okay there's two houses nice green lots and everything and then there's an empty lot muddy uh sometimes cars are parked there things that could be done to improve a neighborhood are more police patrol and like for the school there could be like more security to secure the kids and more teacher student involvement because I, what i notice is there's a lot of kids that they're dropping out because the teachers aren't helping them out and well the teachers just start relating to them and you know show them there's more potential out there for them than just dropping out having kids and you know doing things in the streets instead of having a good job well, my free time i usually spend it either in humble park playing football with my friends or i'll just go chill at a friend's house in different neighborhoods or i'm here at work and see tvn well, my haircut, I go to Sports Cuts or Luquillos, but basically I go to Sports Cuts because they cut your hair there, they could do your eyebrows, and they also braid your hair there, and that's one of the best places I go to braid my hair. And it's just not a place to get your hair cut, it's also a place to like communicate with everybody and, you know, find out what's been happening in the neighborhood. My neighborhood, there's a lot of African Americans and Puerto Ricans, and like, uh, economically, there's a lot of middle class and a lot of welfare people that live there. Um, Education-wise, there's a high dropout rate, like the majority of them are dropouts, but like certain ones exceeded that level and are in college and they're like bankers, accountants for bread companies like Anella and you know, different things like that. Well, the flags, I know they're, they're put up maybe like four, five years ago, I'm not sure when, but I know they're 50 foot flagpoles that, were between, that are between Western and California and they represent El Paso Boricua and that is basically all of Division Street between Western and California. There's a lot of Puerto Rican influence like when it comes to June when the Puerto Rican festival happens uh, everybody gets together it's not just for Puerto Ricans there's blacks there's Mexicans Puerto Ricans there's even Asians that go to it everybody goes there just to have a good time to have good food there's a lot of Caucasians moving in and you know Puerto Ricans and African Americans don't really like that because everybody's used to everybody and now there's like a majority of Caucasians moving in into the condos that were once empty lots and well that's still kind of like it's kind of weird because usually think oh Humble Park is bad and now it's turning kind of Caucasian-ish but really it's not because there's not that many Caucasians there and it will always be Humble Park it will always be a Puerto Rican African American neighborhood that will never change. He just missed 18 years, a great moment in my life. She missed out 16 years of my life. She was never there. She left me so lonely and abandoned. Because he wasn't there, he made me a stronger person. Without any struggles, there's no progress. It makes me stronger every day. It made me think about the past and my father. It feels weird because everybody's watching my life story. I don't know if I could put him in my life. I don't know, I'm 16 years old, and I blew out my candle lights, made one wish 16 times. It was to have my mom back in my life for the first time ever. That lady that brought me upon this world abandoned me when I was two years old. Then, 
Out of 17 years, you wasn't there. One to three birthdays or six to seven visits doesn't mean that you was there. In the next hour, minute, and seconds, I will be 18. Hi, my name is Lornell Reed. I'm 17 years old and I attend the ACT Charter School. My name is Angela Rivera. Uh, I'm 18 years old. I go to Roberto Clemente High School and I'm a senior. For a long time, I had a grudge against my father. It's like he was just my enemy and I didn't want to accept him who he was. My father, I just didn't want to accept him. But as I got older and as time went past, I just didn't think about it no more. He had it rough because his father wasn't, you know, there. Okay, one time it was uh, for Lionel's graduation, his eighth grade graduation to be specific. And it wasn't the best. Well, it was the best. It was like a very important moment for him. But it was like everyone else was there and his mother was there and his father wasn't there. And it was like, he kind of felt, you know, not all the way supported because it's like in order for you to be supported by your family you need everyone that you just don't need your mother there so it's like yeah i did not have a role model because my only role model was myself it was just to be positive become successful the best way you can be so i just say i'm a better person without a father that's like an encouragement because there was no male role model in my life honestly the memories that I could ever remember of my mom is just like her being high and telling me that she loves me. Um, other than that, I have no other memory of her. How did yeah, she what kind of high she gets? Yeah. She be on her. She be on another world. You know how some people they act crazy. Did you want me to act like her too? Uh, if you could. No, I don't think so. Oh. She just get high and she just she won't be here. She'll be somewhere else. The only thing I always see her was smoking. And then getting high. That's all? She didn't do coke That's or all. heroin? Oh, uh, yeah. Shine a white. What's that? <laughs> we don't need to know. Heroin. Never mind. Um, it's heroin, okay. She wasn't clean, so she couldn't take care of me. Um, I just think, like, she had to do what she had to do. Drugs was just her priority. It's sad to say, I can't say nothing about you that's good or bad or anything at all. I think every child needs that father companion, you know, that that one-on-one -on -one with the other parent. But me raising a single parent, I think I did pretty good. To bring the, my father's situation up after a great amount of time, it just makes you think. And it made me think because that was one reason I didn't want kids. In your life. He did you a favor. Think about it. All your most, all your brothers and sisters, they young, got children, or they got a record, or they out there doing something they got no business doing. When they say your name, I can hold my head up high. Not give her blood up to drugs. I hope that when I turn 18, she appears in my life. But this birthday was the worst ever because as the numbers get closer to 18, it's not the same. I wrote that when I turned 16. Amable, cariñosa, tranquila, si no la molesta, ve. Y, como yo digo, siempre se pasa alegre. Me gusta hacer mi trabajo. Me gusta tra el trabajo de la escuela, porque yo quiero que ella sea una una persona en el mañana de un gran futuro. Like why she did it. Like I really want to know why she left me to drugs. You know? Like I just sometimes I can't even sleep at night, you know, just thinking about stuff like that. Like I don't even know my brother. Right? right? And like my mom's side of the family comes up to me, "Oh, girl, you remember this? How am I supposed to remember that?" It's just like like thinking of having a better life and having money and having a car and just, you know, being yourself and that's what motivates me to have all those positive things. Uh, where did you see yourself? 
Wow. Uh, in five years, I'll be 22. I, uh, man, I want to be done with my nursing career. I want to make sure I have my PT Cruiser. I want to, I want not so far much of an apartment, but, uh, yeah, in five years, I just, I want my uh, career goals kind of not too set, but set, and just be myself. You had, you did not have nothing that a lot of other people had in their life. So that just the only thing that could do is just make you stronger. Um, don't let that stop you from reaching your goal because just don't. You're just another person in your life. That's it. So just don't let that stop you from doing nothing. That's all I got to say. My name is Joy, and I am a colored girl. Brown painted work of art with wide hips and thick lips. A colored girl. Not just yellow, blue, green, or red, but all colors and shades swirl into one ebony colored piece. A colored girl. Big brown eyes, so subtle yet sudden. Raven curls that refuse to be tame. A colored girl. With Blood that flows like rivers with memories of sunsets on the savannah, chains on the sea, cowhide drawing blood, and feet marching on monuments. A colored girl named Joy. And who are you to try and dim my colors? You, who are the same color. Same eyes, same skin, same blood, same history. Why is it that my pride is your shame? Why does my success anger you so much that you attempt to make me the victim of your parted lips, of your lies and insecurities, of your broken dreams? To whisper into devouring ears that receive, rearrange, and redistribute your lies. To send wordy serpents that wrap around my brain, sinking their fangs into my frontal lobe, injecting venomous thoughts that paralyzes my pride and deteriorates my confidence. Why? Why do you insist on being the one called misery? To be the one who spreads hate, mistrust, and hostility. Why do you try and turn everyone against me? To make them hate, laugh at, and humiliate me. Oh, you must think that phases me. Don't you know that I am a colored girl? Not a ghetto girl, not a hood brat, not a black girl. A colored girl. Strong and beautiful. Insult me all you want. It won't change what I or you see in the mirror every day. So what if I'm not light, bright, and two shades from being white? I am the darker sister. Reminiscent of hazelnut coffee, starlit skies, and rich cocoa delicacies. And so what if I'm not TV pretty or model size? My big brown eyes, wide nose, and full lips still catch the young suitor's eyes. And my wide hips and thick thighs still hypnotize. So what if you get others to join in on your hatred? I don't care how many you turn on me. Joy, the colored girl, doesn't need anybody. Joy can always survive on its own. But misery, oh, misery loves company. I know who you are, misery, and you don't faze me. Because my name is Joy, and I am a colored girl. 
Brown painted work of art with wide hips and thick lips. A colored girl. Not just yellow, blue, green, or red, but all colors and shades swirled into one beautiful ebony colored piece. The rainbow that penetrates misery's storm of hate and insecurity. Oh, misery, you mad, you hate. Well, it's hard not to because I am a colored girl. You know what I'm saying? It's a lot of problems that come with killing people. Like, if you kill him, it's like he killed your partner. He Just like I'm finna come for him, people gonna come for me because I killed him. Because, you know, we losing a lot of people. You know, we're losing a generation of folks right now, quite honestly. You know, because there is no coming back if you know, if you are shot, murdered. Gun violence with teenagers in CPS has kind of only exploded within the last two years. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that gun, by, gun access is probably easier than it was, say, 10, 15 years ago. My own personal opinion is I think is, is one aspect because we talk about gun violence and who 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 is happening to and who's, you know, the victims as well as the pressure ways we're talking about youth of color. It's one of the things, you know, that that unfortunately that in terms of how, you know, a lot of young people or people in general, you know, just large society about how they're choosing to deal with those emotions or feelings revert to using guns. Um Particularly when I was going to high school, I went to a CPS high school, uh, Harlan, on 96 in Michigan. Uh, we didn't have a lot of issues of gun violence at the school, but we had a lot of fist fights and a lot of people got jumped on. Uh, what I would say is, um, I think the gun culture and the issue of students having access to guns, I think that's something that has to be explored because it's very obvious that students have easy access to guns in their neighborhoods and through people they know. So there's not necessarily a lot of incidents of gun violence within CPS schools. I think the issues of gun violence take place around the school and in the neighborhood. And I think that when students who go to those CPS schools are killed, then the issue of uh, gun violence is kind of magnified or made bigger. I go to our alternative school, and it's located on <laughs> 45th and Wales. It's like, I go there because, you know, I got kicked out of my regular school for some other stuff. And now I go here to, you know what I'm saying, better myself. Because people think that's the quickest way to solve their problems. They think that if you shoot them and kill them and it's, it's over with. It ain't no gonna be nothing after that. Cause that's, you gonna go to jail for shooting somebody. You gonna go to jail for shooting somebody, you gonna get, you know what I'm saying? It's a lot of problems that come with killing people. Like, if you kill him, it's like he killed your partner. He Just like I'm finna come for him, people gonna come for me cause I killed him. If you use a gun, you can kill somebody in just point blank range. I mean, less than a second. And so you're talking about, like I said, the loss of life and the expectation that somebody has wronged you, but you're going to the full extent of killing another person. And you can, once you kill somebody, they can never come back from that. So I think that even if people, even if guns didn't exist, people will still have conflict. But then, you know, the conflict will be at a point where people probably wouldn't lose their life as easily. There wouldn't be so many killings, I guess. Because that's all, that's where all the killings coming from. People getting shot, you know. If it weren't no guns, people would be fighting more than they'd be shooting. So people wouldn't be dying, it'd just be bruised up and stuff like that. I think that um, 
you hear about gun violence typically every week and almost every weekend now with teenagers. And I think it's absolutely a big issue. I think the issue of gun violence and gun access is actually starting to become more of an issue in the newspapers now because more and more teenagers are starting to die. So um, there definitely is something wrong uh, when you have five teenagers on average every weekend getting shot for any various amount of reasons. That's one of the things that definitely is in terms of, you know, more criminalization of youth and, you know, um, and how you justify why youth need to be locked up is, okay, you show, you give this, you paint this picture, you show this picture of youth as being, you know, violent, using guns or other things. And, you know, one thing here in Chicago is that one big thing is that there's a lot of change happening in neighborhoods of color, you know, where there's a lot of new development that's, that's happening. Um, and so I think that in terms of, you know, ways to, to try to get rid of folks, basically, you, you, show, this, you, you show this picture of as, as being violent, as being killers and whatnot. And in Chicago's neighborhoods, it's a lot tougher to live. And so people feel like, well, you know, I have to survive and I'm always in survival mentality. And that kind of sometimes translates into, you know, a heightened sense of, um, you know, negativity when it comes to one-on-one -on -one violence. We just want people to have some, we want to help students develop a sense of self-confidence to the point where even if you're trying to develop a reputation, it's in the, it's in the right way. And well, okay, let's, how can we work this thing out peacefully? Let's sit down here and talk about it. And then, and then from that, hold each other accountable to those things. Kids don't make sinners and stuff like that. More, more sinners and more activities. And, and, and certain communities with the with the with a lot of violence, so that you know kids have better stuff to do than just to go outside and grab a gun, and go crazy. You know what I'm saying? Have them playing basketball, football, you know, stuff like that. Where I think the empowerment has to take place in neighborhoods that are affected by gun violence on a daily basis is it has to be reinforced not only through schools but also in getting more resources to neighborhoods. Man, you know I'm out of smoke out of gear. Now you finna have another one. Hey, you know I'm in that last one. Rocky Joe. Tell you, man. Shake in it. Brandon, you coming? I don't smoke. Y'all gonna have drinks? Yeah, we gonna have everything on deck. Well, if y'all have drinks, I'm gonna definitely be there. All right. Hey, you know I'm gonna come bring that six for the fifty. No, we gotta keep the hundred sets though. We in some patrols since Brianna don't smoke. Yeah. Hey, Ashton. Yeah, what's up? Hey, Joe, you going to the uh, smoke out? Smoke out when? This weekend. This weekend? I might have to go to practice. You think I can do it after? Yeah, it's Friday night 10, duh. All right. It's gonna be at his house, right? Yeah, it's gonna be at my career. Hey, what you doing after the smoke out, though? I might Probably go pass out some back piece. white pod. Man, you gotta Look, practice later, yeah, Joe, man. Hit the blunt, Joe. You, 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 you take it all day. You let the weed burn. <laughs> Come on, man. In the air, exhale. Oh, man. You gotta learn how to take that to the head, Joe. Oh, 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 she gonna make me drop my blunt, oh, oh, oh. You don't even do that. You don't even, even do that. <laughs> nah, I'm not trying to hit none of that. All I see is you over here hitting a blunt. <laughs> That's not even like you. So this you? This you? Yeah. No, no. Y'all just got him out here smoking. Like. Who 
Yeah, you smoking right. out here with these ducks. Weed, Joey, don't worry about it. He put don't fat worry about it. I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> Let me speak to you. Yeah. You feel me? Yeah, I'm still with my smoke. So that's what you do, you hang with trash? What did you say? You want to be a junkie? You don't come to school? I come to lunch. You just oh, wait so you missed the funny man. I come to lunch. So what you was just doing over there? Smoking with them junkies? You don't even come to school. That's a shame. So you know what? Forget it. You can hang with them. Bye. Yogi. It's not even that. Like he, he, me and him had a talk today, and he said that he, he don't see the same thing that he saw in me before, and like I'm not being responsible and whatnot. So let me ask you a question. What's up? Is you still six one? Do you got a vertical inch vert? Boy, the, you ain't lost nothing. Whatever it is, that's Joe, we finna smoke, blow, Joe. Let's go. We finna blow, Joe. You All right, blow? man. You definitely All had right, a point. Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. I gotta go to practice. You gotta practice that day. You got that. Man, it's crazy, man. I got so much on the line, and I'm putting everything in jeopardy. Got scholarships, but I still don't want to disappoint my friends because they're going to call me a lame. I don't know what to do, yo. Should I smoke again? I'm seeing a change in myself, and I'm I'm not liking the new me. So it is what it is. Like no, y'all, rechange your man and go with us and try to tell you. Man, stimulate your man, Ashton. Let's nah, get you high. Try to tell you. I'm a bud influence, y'all. But I'm gonna see y'all around. Just my bad, Papa. Oh, smoke. 